So today I'm going to talk about, here's the theme. Square roots and supersymmetry. So like the actual purpose of this talk is to just kind of be a, um, you know, more, there's more supersymmetry factor on that we need. And it's kind of difficult, it was, I found it kind of difficult to actually get 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 a storyline out of this because it is kind of like, here's the here's the fields, here's the representations, woo. -woo. Um, but I think I think I found a good proof. But the idea is that basically supersymmetry is a fancy way of taking square roots of familiar objects. And in fact, this is actually how it was invented. I mean, Dirac, when Dirac made the Dirac operator, what he said is like, I want a wave equation, something that looks like the Laplacian. We will accept in an indefinite metric, but the Laplacian second order, and that makes relativity be unhappy. So I need a first order version of the Laplacian. So I'm just a little historical aside. We have the square root of the Laplacian, which is the square root of negative uh, partial t squared plus partial x squared plus dot dot dot. Right, like this was constructed by Dirac. This was the original motivation behind behind all of like this this theory. It's via Dirac operators, which is D is a it's a first order operator, but it's acting not on you know functions but on spinners. So we're going to see what these spinners are later in the, in the time, but this is just basically a little like historical uh, tidbit to get your juices flowing. Okay. Any questions before I get started proper? Awesome. Let's get started. Um, so we'll start with her. So this is a review of what I talked about last time, and it's this notion of the supersymmetry algebra, not just an algebra with supersymmetry, not just a super algebra, but the supersymmetry algebra. In other words, when physicists are talking about supersymmetry, they only care about a single, you know, family of algebras, pretty much. This is defined as um, going to be a supersymmetry extension of the isometries, um, the Lie algebra of isometries of Euclidean space. So that's going to be denoted by ISO. Um, So this is the Lie algebra of isometries of R2, comma one. R2, comma one means we're looking at um, R3 with a with a metric with an indefinite metric whose signature has two plus signs and one minus sign. Okay, I'm going to point out a difference from last time. The difference is. Oh, saucy, bye bye. Um, can people see that? Is that no, not at all? Okay, let's try purple. That good? Better? A little bit better. Okay, maybe uh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just use black. So the difference in particular is that I'm looking at dimension equals three now. Last time I spent all of my time talking about dimension equals four. Um, the reason for this is first off, most of this story extends to other dimensions. It's just the details that are different. And in particular, these details um, end up working a lot nicer for us and we'll have to carry around less fields 
later on when we actually, you know, start describing our little objects. Uh, it's also the convention that um, main man Hitchin follows in the paper that I'm roughly following. So that's the reason for the change. Okay, so we're calling um, so far. That's so far. Okay, so we're calling this the super point car algebra. Because this algebra of isometries of space time is called the Poincare algebra, which are going to denote S I S O of three of oops, S that up again, two, comma one. Um, which we're going to talk about as a Lee super algebra. So let's write this as its even part and its hard odd part. So this is the Lee super algebra structure. All right. Um, where we define the super Poincaré algebra is specifically an algebra such that one, the even part is isomorphic to the original algebra. And two, The odd part is a spinner representation. So let's recall. That by the basically the natural grading on our algebras, if we take the inner pro of the Lie algebra, the Lie bracket of the odd of an odd element with an even element, you're going to get an odd element back. But what we can think of, and this is like linear and satisfies some nice properties. But you can think about this as a statement that basically the adjoint of the even part acts on the odd part. It furnishes a representation of the even part on the odd part. That's a representation where G0 acts on G1. Um, so what we can do is we can just identify the odd part of the Lie algebra. We can just basically describe it as a vector space, as a representation of the even part. That gives us most of the structure that we care about. Um, and in particular, a spinner rep is a certain type of representation of SO2. So, i.e., we have the following. Can people see if I'm down here? We have that... R three comma one. Let's just call this S. Um, yeah, let's call that S. So G one isomorphic to S. We're just calling S the spinner out spinner representation. Oh, uh, the start of the representation of G naught. Yeah. So S S one is a representation of G naught. Okay. And basically, we can explicitly say what how the Lie bracket works when we restrict to looking at the odd part acting on even part. So one part of the even part is the uh, vectors, and we say that r three comma one and s is equal to zero, and we say that um, s o two. Oh, I messed that up again. I'm sorry. Two comma one and S is also in S. This is the spinner up. Okay. I'm going to talk about what the spin rep is right about now, but so far, all good? Awesome. So that's our little review. Um, so now we get to square root negative, to the first square root, the first sort of you know, manifestation of the square roots in supersymmetric principle. Square root number one, which I'm going to call spinners are square roots of vectors. And this is just a little preview for where we're heading with this. But basically, let's define what a spinner representation is and sort of see how a spinner representation is in a sense, a square root 
of a vector representation. Whereby when I say vector representation, I mean the standard one of S02, comma one on R3, comma. We'll get to that. Okay. So, and let's let me start with a little bit of an anecdote. Um, how many people here have heard of the uh, relationship between quaternions and 3D rotations? Maybe thumbs up, down, mill for if you've heard of it or not. Yeah. So um, I remember a story where um, a CS person was basically was giving a talk, and they noticed that the quaternions, if you restricted to an uh, to a two dimensional subspace, it had some really really great properties. For example, this two-dimensional subspace, then the quaternions don't give rotation of three-dimensional space, it gives rotation of that two-dimensional subspace. And uh, the CS student uh, designated his new discovery the biternions. Uh, little did he realize he just inadvertently rediscovered complex numbers. Um, which is, you know, it's a little bit funny how you can, like, how can you even learn quaternions about complex numbers? But I guess the moral of the story is that, like, like quaternions are even taught in, um, CS classes because they're very useful for rotating 3D objects, you know, which is a fundamental thing people want to do when they want to make graphics. So this is just a little bit to say that quaternions are very fundamental for rotations in 3D space, just like complex numbers. If you multiply by the unit circle in complex numbers, that gives rotations of two-dimensional space. Um, so we can understand, so this is like a, this gives us a sort of theme that um, we're going to be exploring, which is understanding rotations by adding different square roots of negative one, right? The complex numbers have the real numbers with a square root of negative one, the quaternions have like three different square roots of negative one. Okay, well, so far. So this is going to let us introduce uh, what, what are called Clifford algebras. So it's going to sort of lead us to Clifford algebras. Um, the idea is We start with R and then we add two roots of negative one and one root of positive one. These are new things we're joining to our algebra. This is meant to relate to our two comma one. We see that two represents the two square roots of negative one and that one represents the square root of positive one. This has to do with the, the signature of your space. Who here, by the way, has seen Clifford algebras before? A little thumb and meter. Okay. A few people, but kind of maybe it's still good to have a review of this because we're going to be using a lot of the in depth objects with this. So we define the Clifford algebra. For a vector space with a bilinear form, this is a essentially. It's going to be our metric, right? So in, in particular, we're going to be looking at our three comma one with its you know natural uh signature two comma one metric that we're using to define all of these things. And the abstract definition is a little bit of a mouthful. So the Clifford algebra, let's uh specialize this to this case, is going to be you're going to start with all tensors, any tensor that you like. So it's going to be R, a uh, direct sum with a vector, direct sum with a rank two tensor. So we're going to do the second tensor product, and so on and so forth. So you're starting with the tensor algebra of our system, and we're dividing out by an ideal, where the ideal is if you take two vectors and tensor them together, they're not going to be you know, a second order tensor anymore. They're going to give you a zero order tensor, and that zero order tensor is going to be the norm of that vector.
So basically, we're getting a new product structure on the tensor algebra. When we tensor things together, if they're the same vector, then you kill both vectors and replace it with their norm, or a negative their norm, modulo sign. Um, we can write this more explicitly to see what's actually going on in terms of generators of this space. So, um, so we're going to let E not D1, D2 be orthonormal basis of R2, comma 1. And we're saying that the Clifford algebra here is isomorphic to the algebra generated by these basis elements modulo the action where we're dividing, sorry, modulo relations that come from this guy specialized to actually these basis elements, which say that E i E j equals negative E j E i for i not equal j. And it says that e not squared equals negative equals positive one. And e1 squared equals e2 squared equals negative one. Okay. So we take a step back and we appreciate what we've done so far. We wanted to add two square roots of negative one, one square root of positive one to the real numbers. So we start with real, we join three things, and we demand that one of them is going to be square root of positive one, and two of them are going to be square roots of negative one. And then we also demand that, in particular, that these are anti commuting. These are anti commuting square root or square roots of plus or minus one. Um, and this gives us our Clifford algebra. Okay, cool with this. So we can think about this as starting with the underlying vector space structure. The vector space structure comes from this anti-commuting property. We can think about so it's like the anti-commuting, you can think about this as anti-commuting tensors with extra conditions applied on top. So as a vector space, we get an isomorphism from the Clifford algebra to the symmetric, uh, sorry, the alternating tensor algebra, the exterior algebra based on this vector space. But the thing is, an algebra is not just a vector space. An algebra is a vector space with a multiplication. So we actually change the multiplication on the exterior algebra. Instead of just wedging things together, we have a multiplication where um, v dot v is equal to basically the norm of v. So in this is an element of the zero exterior product of the space. Where, so basically, you combine two degree one elements, you get a degree zero element. This only happens for you know, basic vectors that are degree one. This is the only relation, but basically all relations generated from this form modulo out by all of these. So it is the exterior algebra with a new multiplication structure. Okay. Here's a specific fact about these guys. One can work out what this algebra is. It's a little exercise. It's maybe it's kind of unpleasant. I don't know. Well, maybe it's just because I don't like algebra. But in fact, we get an isomorphism with complex two by two matrices. which 
And um, yeah, that's kind of a big, that's kind of an interesting, right? Because complex two by two matrices, remember, what are we looking for with all of this? We're looking for representations. And Clifford algebras are fundamentally ways to, you know, we construct this algebra, but now we also have a natural representation of it. It's just the natural representation that you get from complex two by two matrices. So we have a natural to them where we're looking at the complex dimensional rep, which we denote by delta. This is the so-called complex spinner representation. So this is actually quite a general fact, even with any other Clifford algebra, you find for the most part that the algebra you get is going to be matrices over some field, be it reals, complexes, or quaternions. That's okay. Over some real division algebra, real complexes or quaternions, maybe some of these two matrices. But basically, in this case, it's particularly simple. We had a nice complex representation. And in fact, um, this representation has another nice property. I'm not, again, I'm not justifying these things for you. I'm just stating facts that one has to show, but it has in fact a real structure, a complex conjugation. And that real structure is invariant under the action of the Clifford algebra. which means we can naturally reduce our two-dimensional complex algebra to a one-dimensional, to a two-dimensional real algebra. Um, I'm just going to say that this has a invariant real structure. So what that statement means or why it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, what it means. So what it means is a real structure I'm defining as a complex conjugation operation. Um, an operation which... On, on what? Though? On this vector space. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this is a vector space that has a, a complex conjugation, and that complex conjugation is preserved in the proper ways when you act on it by elements of the Clifford algebra. Awesome. Okay. There we go. This bad boy, if you notice, it's the same symbol of as this. That's not a coincidence. So you call it a real story. Do you mean like a complex? Maybe I'm just confused by something. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's, this it's, it's a real vector space, then you upgrade it to a complex vector. Yeah, this is this is a confusing, a confusing thing because it that, that is true. We can start with a real vector space upgraded to a complex vector space, but there's an alternative thing where we start with a complex vector space and add a real structure on top of it. And then we can basically say that this complex vector space comes from a complexification of a real vector space. I see, I see. So we can say yeah, I... this relationship, we, re we relate this as saying that um, S tensor with C over the real numbers is isomorphic to delta as vectors, as representations. Okay. So what's the spin stuff? Now we finally get spin. Spin, the spin group two comma one is defined to be um, the group generated by so this is a sub um, this is a subset of the Clifford algebra. And it's defined to be the group generated by unit norm elements in the Clifford algebra, specifically the invertible unit norm elements. So the elements which, um, let's write this, I said units, but I don't like algebra, so I'll write invertible elements. Yeah. 
So some examples of this in the general construction of is like the complex numbers. The complex numbers are a Clifford algebra. The spin group you get associated to the complex numbers are the unit norm complex numbers, basically U1, their rotations. Analogously, on the quaternions, the unit norm quaternion, since every quaternion um, is invertible, the quaternions are also a Clifford algebra, and the spin group inside of that corresponds to the unit ball inside the quaternions, which is SU2. John? Does norm one not, not, not imply invertible here? It does not in this case, I believe, because specifically, we're looking at invertible in the Clifford algebra. So the Clifford algebra, we're looking for basically a vector where if I multiply it by another vector, I get back one, the unit. But if you see, the only relation I have is that the with itself gives you the norm. So maybe that does actually tell you it's invertible. Okay, actually, sorry, I, I mixed this up. So it is all unit one, norm one elements are invertible. They might generate an element that is not invertible. We're gonna look at all of the elements that it generates and take specifically the invertible ones. I think that's what I wanna say, yes. I'm confused, like, how does this have a real, how is there a real, like, sub-representation of this? Is that, like, what you're saying? This up here is saying that there is a, 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 there is a real representation which complexifies to the given representation here. Wait, what is that, like? What does that mean? You're like, you're, aren't you saying that, you say it had the invariant real structure, mm -hmm. like, you're saying that there's some CL, like, 2-1 invariant conjugation operation? Yes. So it's also like C2 invariant conjugation? It's also C2. Um, yeah. Like, like, what would that be? What would that be? Well, I mean, this is just, I think. So doesn't that mean that you are you have, um, or, yeah, I don't know. Like, what was? Mm, it's a good question. Like, are you not saying that there's a real sub-representation? Maybe it's not. So this should be a sub-representation. Not maybe it's not. Mm, is that true? You're right because basically you're saying C complex two by two matrices act transitively on C two. Yeah. Um. So then, how can there be a real sub representation? Um. Is it true that if it preserves the norm, then it preserves the real slice of it? I think it should be true. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a sub representation. It's, it's, you just have an involution that commutes with the action of. Algebra. We're like, what would that be? I think is it is it just like the norm, like the the usual. So, so I think if, 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 if two by two matrices act on C two. Okay. Conjugation commutes with. Why is this? So it, wait, that's true, right? Conjugation doesn't commute. Right? Oh, it doesn't. Right, yeah. <laughs> like you take the negative, then that commutes, for example. But yeah, I don't right, think right, that's yeah, I'm, I'm, the conjugation. Um. Let's see, so what we're looking for is we have complex matrices acting on complex vectors. What I want to say is that the real structure is just the normal complex conjugation on each of the elements of the vector. Is that preserved by complex matrices? Um, no, that would be preserved by real matrices. So I don't know. Um, what I'm going to say is, I'm gonna put a big star here. Is, is, is there an involution on, on the Clifford algebra? Which Clifford which Clifford algebra? Oh, Clifford algebra. Um, no, so this is already a real algebra. It's not a complex algebra. It just happens to be isomorphic to this complex algebra. Um, so I'm going to put a star and say this is an exercise because I think that I again I'm also kind of confused by this. Um, Right. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Okay. Well, there might be like some non-trivial conjugation thing that I can't think of. I don't know. It has to, it's also like you have to define what the conjugation. Well, okay, I don't know. Yeah, it's some conjugation C2. And can anyone else help with this? It's just that. Uh, you, you do have uh taking on good transpose on C2. So I guess the statement is that maybe the complex conjugation on 
this vector space also comes with a complex conjugation on the, the algebra itself. But, but then the algebra is like, Right. Okay, right. So maybe that this involution, so this, for example, does have the conjugate transpose. That is an involution on this. It's not, strictly speaking, a real structure because this is a real algebra, uh -huh. but it would be an involution on... This construction goes um, I don't think in general, oh. not in general, but in this case it might, because this fact that the representation is actually a complexification of a real representation is very special to CL2, comma one. This is generally something that only happens um, one out of eight dimensions, basically. This repeats if you go up eight dimensions, you go up another eight dimensions and so on. But in general, you do not expect this to be true. It's not uniform. We do get similar facts to this. You can represent the this representation in terms of real representations, but it's not as clean. This is actually why I picked dimension equals three. I, I actually have one. Wait, the, wait, the way you stated it, it's definitely that you're saying there's a real subject. Like right. if it's if it's conjugation equivariant, and there's something fixed by conjugation. But, but the then, Q can't. I don't know if it's true. I don't think there is an actual. But there isn't. Yeah, it's not true that there is a real subject. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there is. So that means like. Like, I guess the way you stated it, there's like something. Different. So I don't, so I think what the, the important fact is this, Okay. more so. I don't know if the fact that there's a real two-dimensional, uh, uh, a real structure that's invariant under the thing, that's just a way to justify this fact here. Um, so I don't know, but... Uh, maybe we can just we can we can put a put a pin in this. Say okay. that we need to fit, we need to go back and figure out how this real representation actually represents the complex representation. But the fact of the matter is, assuming the sources and following are right, there is there exists such a representation that complexifies to the spin representation. This delta up here. Okay, people happy or people uh, mitigated um, sadness. I want to. I think for your purpose, what you mean is a real representation of spin two one. Not, exactly. Not, not, not the. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm, spin two one is SL two R. Yeah, I'm just uh, about to build that. Yeah, but uh, the thing is, the SL two R representation, the standard one, is not this representation that I'm building. Okay. That's different. That's a different representation. Um. Okay. Before we can you tell you what the norm is on this? I don't know what you mean. Uh, norm. So we have a norm on the Clifford algebra, which is this tensor algebra that is basically comes from the inner product on uh, on this guy extended to all tensors. Like, what's the number of EI tensor EJ? Just one. Um, EI tensor, EI tensor EJ for well, it depends on which I what I and J are, but for like a for a positive definite metric, then that would just be one. Oh, yeah. okay. 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 I'm pretty sure. No, I'm sorry. I lied. That is, this is the standard route. Like maybe this is a long way to go about it, but this is a more fundamental, uh, in a sense way, because this applies to all Clifford algebras. But the idea is we have essentially a representation. Um, we can this inherits the representation. And inherits that real representation. Let's look at what it is. So we have an isomorphism, um, spin two comma one. This is something that one can show is isomorphic to SL2, R, which carries a standard two-dimensional real representation, exactly what she was saying. I'm sorry, I lied earlier. That is absolutely this spinner representation. Okay. And why do we care about this? What was the whole point of all of this construction with Clifford algebras and representations of the Clifford algebra and all of this stuff, yeah? Sorry, what was the definition of norm? So the norm in this case, so what, let's say, let's write, let's write this. So norm 
on CL. is inherited from the norm on the tensor algebra. I'm just going to write CLR to equal one. And it follows the same thing. For example, like in, in differential geometry, you have differential forms. And you can extend a Ramanian metric on, you know, the cotangent bundle to, to the Ramanian metric on arbitrary n forms. Basically, by extending it, you know, multilinearly and the only way that you know how to tensor products. And that's exactly what uh, the norm is. Um, so I guess the norm of V1 tensor V2 um, is going to be norm of V1 squared, norm of V2 squared, I think. Okay. And we just sort of extend that to the rest of the tensor algebra. And why is this, like, isn't this seven dimensional? If CL21 is eight dimensional. Right, so this is the group generated by norm. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's be let's be precise about this. You're right. Spin two comma one is the group generated by norm one element of specifically R two comma one subset of C L two comma one. Oh, okay. So basically, we have this exterior algebra structure. This is our vector space structure for the Clifford algebra. And we're looking at specifically the um, the degree one part, and we're taking the norm one elements of that. These are all invertible. And what we're doing is we're generating, seeing every possible ten every possible element of the Clifford algebra we can get from that. Not all of those are invertible, but the ones that are invertible, we can take those out, pick those out, and that one are going to give us spin two comma one. Yeah. Uh Wait, what do you mean invertible here? Invertible as in invertible inside the algebra of, inside the Clifford algebra. An algebra person would say they are units of the algebra, but basically there exists some other element of the algebra which multiplies that element to give one. So generated by norm one elements. So, so norm one elements in the degree one are all invertible? Norm one elements in degree one are all invertible. So let's write this down. But you also need that they're invertible within R21, right? So it's been to one in the process. Well, here there are there's self numbers. So let's be precise. So we, we have specifically CL two comma one star is the group of elements. The group of units, sorry. Like if I multiply two units, I have another group. Yes. Um, is that true for everything? Yes. Going? I think what you're saying is that it's the group of invertible elements in the algebra generated by norm one elements. The group of invertible elements of CL21 in the algebra, the subalgebra of CL21, generated by the norm one elements of, oh, okay. of the can, vector space. I can add them too. I can add these norm one elements. Uh, yes. Uh, but we're only going to take the invertible. Well, um, no, 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 you can't. Sorry, you can't add them. Because, for example, in the complex case, uh, complex numbers, the spin group you get from that is just U1, so straight up the unit norm elements. So we're just going to multiply them. But, but if I multiply norm one elements, if I multiply invertible elements, just... is that true in the tensor algebra? Because they're, they're, norm, they're norm one invertible elements of R2, comma, one. So they're they're still their product is still going to be invertible, but it's not going to be an R two comma one. It won't be an R two comma one. That's fine. That's fine though. So let's draw a picture of this. Um, group of uh, CL two one generated by norm one elements in R two. So let's see. Let's see. So we have. Wait, wait. So, so they have to be in R two one. The generators are in R two one. Yeah. But then, like, you multiply those things, and you can get something that's not. In R21. Okay, but, but but why do I have to put this invertibility condition? There's still going to be invertible, right? Maybe I don't think you need invertibility. Maybe. Yeah. So we have R21 sitting inside of CL2, comma one. This is like the exterior algebra on top of R2, comma one. And we look right here, and we are looking at. We start with these norm one elements in there. So this is we're going to call this. 
In R2, comma one, we have to norm one elements. And then the spin group is saying, we're gonna take those elements and we're gonna multiply them together in all the ways we know how. And we're going to basically get this, I'll um, kind of visualize it like this. So this is spin two comma one is generated by, let's, let's call the norm one elements, let's call those S two comma one, I guess, just uh, that's bad notation. Uh, let's call them N, I don't know. So the spin two comma one is generated by N by Clifford multiplication. That's the picture we have. So I guess the, the question is, why are we looking specifically at the group of units of the Clifford algebra? Um, because we're saying that, like, look, let's, uh, if we, if we, if we restrict to normal elements of the unit vector space, then we know by this defining property of the Clifford algebra that normal elements, if you just multiply them by themselves, they square to one. They square to the unit. So that gives us this little guy right here. And then we're saying that if we multiply, so these are invertible elements in the Clifford algebra. And if we multiply them together, then they should still be invertible elements in the Clifford algebra. I guess is what people are saying. So why are we restricting to the group of units like this? Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a good answer right now. Um, but this this is the picture. Okay. So let's Wait, are there non-unit in normal elements? No. In the Clifford algebra, yes. Yes, in the Clifford algebra, oh, they do exist. Okay. But you might not be able to get to them from multiplying together norm one elements of the base algebra. Okay. I think that's true. So multiplication of the elements of O21 doesn't doesn't necessarily stay under O21? Uh yes, because basically this is specifically we have this decomposition. So inside here we have we have this is isomorphic to okay, yeah, 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 right. um one basically uh, one tensors, right? Vectors. And if we multiply them together, we'd usually get, we'd either get a two tensor or we'd get a zero tensor because of this multiplication rule or something in between. So in fact, if you multiply two elements of, you know, R2 comma one, you'll never get something in R2 comma one back again. Okay. Um, what's the um, norm that's on the tensor algebra? The norm that's on the tensor algebra is basically a norm that's inherited from the norm on this guy, basically, oh. you take the inner product of each of the elements in turn. And we said that that was something a little strange, the normal putting on R21. Oh. The normal putting on R21 not... is a little bit strange in the sense that it's not Euclidean. In other words, it's not positive definite, the metric. It is indefinite. So you can get negative norm elements. But um, for, for the perspectives of this, that isn't really coming into play. That's not messing with anything. Yeah, I guess the minor comment is that the, the unit ball is not really a ball, but it's like a... Oh, so uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. So the unit ball, because we're an indefinite metric, the unit ball would be better drawn like this, like a unit, like a hyperbola. And then the spin group, like in this case, is sort of like a fancier hyperbola, which we can think of as, um, let's see if I can draw this. So we have, we have the hyperbola here, and we're saying we're turning it into a hyperboloid. That's basically the, the picture that's going on. And we can do the same thing on this side. Like that. So this is because we're in the Minkowski metric. Absolutely, that's true, is that it changes the picture of what we expect the spin group to look like in particular. Note that SL2, sorry, spin, two comma one is non-compact. Uh, because we're an indefinite metric. Okay. Um, let me quickly finish off this. Can I finish this off quickly? 
let me just say, so the spin group, we have our spin group here. Um, the spin group inherits a real representation. And as I said, we can describe this explicitly. It's just straight up, you know, it's isomorphic to SL2R. It's what you'd expect. And the idea is that basically the spin group is a double cover. So let's put this in a little box up here. Spin two comma one is actually a double cover of SO two comma one. And it's a universal cover. And because you can, you know that the pi two of uh, SO two comma pi one of SO two comma one is equal to Z two. So, you know, it's a double cover in particular. It's a non-trivial double cover that proves that it's the universal cover, which means that we have a correspondence between representations of spin two comma one and representations of um, the Lie algebra. So we essentially have, I don't want to say an isomorphism because I don't know the detail. Yeah, an isomorphism, let's say that. We have an isomorphism between the Lie algebra SO2,1 between reps of this, of the Lie algebra, and reps of the, of the associated universal cover, uh, spin 2,1. And in particular, SO2,1 inherits the spin representation. And this is the spinner representation that we care so much about. That's what that was the point of all of this. Basically, let's let's end this with a little bit of philosophizing. What did we do? We wanted to um, understand the representation theory of the Poincaré group, um, and in particular the the Poincaré algebra and of SO two comma one. And we said it's hard to understand these guys, because we can understand the representations of big SO2,1, but that doesn't necessarily give us all of them because it's not simply connected. How do we make it simply connected? The idea is we introduce square roots to the original system. This gives us a new way of looking at um, rotations. We look at rotations as coming from actions on this Clifford algebra. In particular, conjugation, here's the sort of secret of how this spin is acting on the Clifford algebra. Uh, it acts by conjugation. Um, on the Clifford algebra, which looks like reflections on the underlying R2, comma 1. So basically, we can we can represent this all very explicitly if we like, but the, the long and short of it is we use Clifford algebras to generate the universal cover of SO2, comma 1. We look at the representations of the universal cover, and because the universal cover is already sitting inside of the Clifford algebra, we can get them from representations of the Clifford algebra, and there's a fundamental canonical representation of the Clifford algebra, which is the lowest dimension and that is our friend, the spinner representation. It's the uh, lowest possible, lowest high weight. It's the it's the highest weight representation for SO2 comma one with lowest possible weight. It's like the most fundamental representation that's non-trivial. That's the idea. I'll say a little bit more about this after the after the fold, but for now, let's let's go have some tea. Okay, so recall, what are we what were we talking about before? It's been like 30 whole minutes, so I, I almost forgot everything already. Um, we basically talked about spin. Uh, 2 comma 1 as um, we constructed that group as a subgroup of the Clifford algebra. Um, oh, and 2 comma 1, I should make something a little correction. I said that you just take the... Uh, the Clifford algebra, and you sort of look at the subgroup generated by elements of uh, norm one, that's wrong. What I described was the pin group. It's actually a, a very, I, this is maybe a very good little, little uh, joke here. You know, because, okay, okay, so like, like, get this, get this. So we have O2 is a double, it, it is a, is, is a SO2 with like a C2 action, right? You know, it's, there's like two, two connected components, you know? So, 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 you know, we to go from O to SO, you know, you, you get rid of the S, right? So imagine we have the spin group. And we want to take the semi-dark product of G2. What do you think we call that? <laughs> Let's get some audience interaction. In. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I put two there. Let's put n. So, I mean, this is a general theorem about spin and pin groups, which is that you just get rid of the S. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you're, if, if, so the S here actually it, it, it means supersymmetry. 
No, the idea is being is named after physics and then some funny guys, I think like in the original Atia bought Shapiro paper on Clifford modules, they were like, this joke is due to Jean-Paul Serre. Uh, funny thing is, Serre is also French. And if you say <laughs> in in French, then you might get a little bit of an extra. Apparently, like people give some resonance to an English speaking country. They're like, kind of like nobody really laughs. But in France, everybody like cracks up every time they mention a pee group. So... Uh, I, I'm not allowed to say what that means in polite company, but uh, okay. So we have the spin group, um, and specifically, what we have is uh, what I should have said is that pin is, an, is part of the Clifford algebra, and spin of divisional one is part of the even part of the Clifford algebra. Essentially, there's this grading by even and odd degrees of the tensor, which is preserved under the product. You don't preserve the full grading, but you do preserve the even and odd part. In fact, you can say, maybe go wild and say that Clifford 2.1 is a super algebra. That's a little bit of a, a, a thematic relevantly, you know, tie into the subject of this course. Um, if you think uh, Finn had like two connected Pin has like two two connected components, one corresponding to the even part, one corresponding to the odd part. Let's just cut out the odd part and link it to the even part. That's spin. The analogy is identical to that of SON and ON. Spin is a double cover of SON, pin is a double cover of ON. Can you explain what the connected components are from the like, early definition? From the what? Like from the definition of like generated by. Yeah, yeah. So the connected components are literally like. The part inside the even and the part inside odd, those two are disjoint connected components. So if you like multiply two things in the odd, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true of also an Owen. If I multiply two things in the, oh. in, you know, orientation oh. reversing things, I get an orientation preserving. It's exactly analogous. Um, so, 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 one thing, one thing that we have, we also constructed. A real topology. space. What was that? Is this a topology? It's inherited from the tensor algebra. So, um, you know, it's basically the Clifford algebra is underlied by a vector space. That vector space is the exterior algebra, has the same topology as the exterior algebra. And it's just a finite dimensional Finite dimensional real vector space, nothing crazy. Wait, and this is. Pin two one contain vectors of length one that are neither in. Oh no, never mind. But I guess one comes like uh, pin n can have more than one, not more than two connected components when the signature is indefinite, right? Um, same as S O R S has two connected components. Ah, uh, yeah. So for example, S O one one looks like this. I, I think it's not like a circle. It's like a hyperbola. And there's two connected components of that. This is a separate description. Uh, but yes, indeed, I think in this two comma one case, you do get like the two sheets of the hyperbola. So maybe there's actually four connected components. Um, but what I mean to say is that basically by promoting from the only the odd, even part to the even and the odd part, that basically serves to double everything up. And that doubling up is exactly analogous to the orthogonal versus special. Yeah. Um, so we had this con constructed real spinner, basically the fundamental representation of um, spin two comma one or in general any spin group. So it's, we call that S, which is a two dimensional real representation. And we use the we can say exactly what it is because we know that spin two comma one is actually isomorphic to S L two comma one. And it's a standard graph on two from the R. You know, it takes is a two by two real matrix. It takes in a real two by two real length two vector spits out a length two vector. Here is something which is special about indefinite metric. We have a pairing. Uh, okay, actually, let's say this a different way. So Clifford, so we have a natural action.
which I'm going to write as a tenth uh, action of um, R of 3, 1, which actually embeds nicely into the Clickert algebra as the, you know, degree one part of the Clickert algebra of the exterior algebra then. R2, 1. R2, 1, thank you. So this embeds naturally as the, you know, the degree one parts of the Clifford algebra. And this acts, you know, this is a representation of the spin group, but we got this representation of the spin group um, from a representation of the Clifford algebra. So this actually acts sending a spinner to another spinner. Um, and let's just call this. Okay, so I can write this um, as a tensor, this action as a tensor. This action is basically take your vector, think of it as an element of the Clifford algebra, and just multiply it like you, you use the usual like spinner representation as defined. Multiply it like you would a Clifford algebra element. So as a tensor, this is an object which sends um, R2, comma, 1, O tensor with the dual of S2, um, what is it doing? Ooh, I guess it is R2, comma, 1, 2, S tensor, that's dual. Why are you not just CL2? So CL21 on S, because S was defined, we, did, we constructed it originally as the natural representation of the Clifford algebra, Clifford algebra as a matrix algebra. We noticed the Clifford algebra was a matrix algebra, notice that we have a representation S, and we said, let's take that representation and we can like, sort of percolate it down through all of these subgroups and realize it as a representation of the spin group. But there's a natural isomorphism between representations of spin groups and representations of their Clifford algebras. Yeah. So is S real or tensor? This is a real. But but I, I but it's like it's the exact thing we were doing before. But it doesn't seem like the Clifford algebra is real. Yeah. Um. Regardless of the description of what the real thing is, uh, I tried to describe it as like the real part of the two by two vectors. But regardless of what the description is, there is. Fundamentally, you can decompose this representation that I told you about into real representations. And in fact, what you find is you get this natural two-dimensional real representation from the Clifford algebra. The description that I gave depends a lot on the specific signatures and the specific two comma one that you use and stuff. But this is a general fact: is that there is a real, um, there is a real representation that you canonically get from the Clifford algebra, and that's called the real spinner representation. But are you sure it's not like PL two one zero or something? Um, but spin is like PL two. Um, CL two one zero. Yeah, spin is. Or is it just like right, right? Like you're taking your even time. part, and that sort of restricts your um right. So, like you know, for the full description of these things, you'd have to talk about you know, there's this decomposition to even and odd parts, and also into um. You can find an, an analog of the Hodge star and right? decompose things into the uh, self dual and anti self dual part, um, which you know gives you another decomposition of the Clifford algebras in addition to the even and odd part. And then these two together actually give you a full description of the Clifford algebras in turn. Uh, and you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole like theory that goes behind this. Um, yeah, as I was saying, is that I don't know how to fix the problem we were having before. And I, I don't I don't know if it'd be helpful to kind of keep to keep hemming about it because I, I don't know. I think what's best is I figure it out and tell you at the beginning of next time. Um right, so as a tensor, we can write this as essentially a pairing. We can just sort of rearrange things until we get a pairing. That basically eats in two spinners and spits out a vector. Um, do I have to use that? Yeah. Now here's the, here's the magical thing. What? Why do we get that? 
Why is that the right quantum? Right, right. That's a that's a good question. So basically, I take in a vector and I act on it on a spinner and I spit out a spinner. So it should take in an element of the dual of. So I guess more formally. So I have so this thing I described up here takes r two comma one dual and it takes in a spinner and it sends it to a spinner and I can move this to one side and move that to the other side. Um, right, right. So the, the order goes the wrong way. You're right. So I have, no, no, this is, this is what I want. So I swap these two. Why do we have, why do we have R2 oh. on dual front? So this I, is, takes in, this, this representation takes in a vector and it takes in a spinner and it spits out a spinner. Yeah. So it takes in, so it's an element, so the, representing it as a tensor, it's an element of the, a dual of the vector space, um, tensor of the dual of the spinner space, right? It, it takes in those two things and it has, is a multilinear map. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a map between the, the dual spaces, right? It should be, but it, uh, it should be an element of R21 dual tensor S dual tensor S, right? Uh, R2 on dual, okay, that, that's fair. Right. Okay, so we have something like this, and then we can turn that into sort of a map. Like this, um, and then there's sort of a magic thing that happens. So the magic thing is that we can actually upgrade this map to a pairing. Um, you know, I hoped that this map would actually just be straight up the pairing, but I think that there's something a little bit more subtle going on here. Um, where we can basically, okay, sorry, let's, let's stop before we get to the magic thing. Note, so we have a fact, which is that S is actually a more than tool. Um, this is, you know, something that one has to show about these guys, but this is a true fact about this representation here. I guess you could describe, you could, you could justify this using the weight spaces, you know, it's a highest weight representation of weight one half, and then I think this follows from that, but. So it's a representation of the Clifford algebras. It's a representation of the Clifford algebras, but we're thinking of it as a representation of the in group. Okay. Um, and. What you're going to do with it, we're going to we get a pairing. Um, from gamma from S dual tensor S dual to R three comma one. Why do we care about this? Well, this is um, this is going to play a important role pretty soon. Um, but what's special? This is a special fact about uh, Minkowski metrics. It's special to signature D minus one one is that the fact that this pairing exists. Um, and always, you know, decomposes the real representations in a right way or something like that. I'm not really sure. So this is like the spinner equals square root of vector. Or is that nice? That's basically this. Yeah. So is the volume element of the Clifford algebra? So that's not quite. So the volume element was the thing that I was describing earlier in very vague terms about finding a new way to decompose it, not just in, ter in terms of even and odd parts, but in terms of plus and minus parts. That's what you use the volume element here for. Therefore, this is a different thing. This is something which actually relates spinners to vectors. Um, and it, it's not inherent to the Clifford algebra. Is this... Is this... So this is, the, this is the operator that you use to create the Dirac operator. It's ultimately constructed from this pairing. 
this idea of, for those who've seen the Dirac operator, we have a derivative and we think of that as an element of the Clifford algebra and then we multiply it by a, um, we apply Clifford multiplication on that and we end up use, getting a, you know, a derivative on spinner fields. That ultimately comes from this relationship between vectors and spinners. For those who have seen it. Is that two one? Yes, two one. Sorry. Uh, three one is what physicists usually use because that's the dimension of real life space time. I'm using two one because of the following fact. This is why I'm using two one in the first place. Gamma is an isomorphism. Or symmetric. Or symmetric tensors. I.e., as a representation, R cube number one. It's isomorphic to the second symmetric power of the dual of the spinner. So let's, this is the model that I said at the beginning. So these are as representations of SO two comma one. So the Lie algebra. I'm just I'm asking that to integrate. Just I'm asking this is oh as as the group. Okay. So this does integrate. Right. S does not in particular. S only integrates on the universal cover spin. And in fact, the reason why it's the second power is exactly the reason why it's you know a double cover. You know, you have a, you go twice around when you're up in the spin group. Um, so what I want to say is the model. This is the model that this entire representation theory thing was going for. I said I wanted to incorporate supersymmetry as a discussion of square roots of familiar objects. In this case, we have that a spinner thought of as the spinner representation of SO2, comma 1 is a square root of a vector, where a vector is the standard representation of SO2, comma 1 as rotations on you know Minkowski space. Okay. Can you explain that again? About uh, like what is a vector? So a vector is this. So when I say vector, I mean vec that this is what physicists mean when they say vector. When they say vector, they mean specifically something which transforms according to the standard representation of one of your matrix Lie groups. In other words, at, um, SO2, comma 1 is a free by free matrix which preserves the um uh two comma one signature two comma one form on r three comma one it has a natural canonical action on r three comma one that's how we defined it in the first place and we call that action the vector representation and we're saying that this representation is a the square root of that representation is a spin representation in other words, a spin representation, two of them together sort of combined to give a vector one. What is S star? The dual. The dual. So there's this weird relationship between S and S star, which I'm kind of unclear about the significance of. But if you kind of cross your eyes, then the star just kind of 
So the glazed so stars acted on the uh, um, spin two one. Yes. So it's acted on by spin two one, but in particular, you can look at the infinitesimal action. So infinitesimal. So we have spin two one acting on a star, but infinitesimally. We have the Lie algebra of spin, but remember, spin is a double cover. It is the same infinitesimal action as the thing we started with, which was x o to comma one, which acts on dual levels. Okay, how do we feel? So I was hoping to talk about supersymmetry today, but I, I'm glad that we finished our first square root. Um, in my couple minutes left, let me let me just wax a little bit about what's going on here. So first off, there's this notion that there seems to be a lot of coincidences in what I said. Like I specialized to specifically this dimension three because it gave me this isomorphism. Um, in general, we don't need that isomorphism. All we need is that we can decompose a vector into, you know, how second powers of the spinner, or like a second power of a spinner always includes a vector part. If I take this representation, uh, I can decompose it into irreps, into irreducible representations, and one of them will be this guy. But again, like when when like when you're in even dimension, then the irreducible representations get all complicated and they split into two parts and stuff, and things get messy and stuff. And basically, this is sort of the theme with um, supersymmetry, is that in every single dimension, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you kind of just like you have to do each of them individually. Um, and there isn't really a unified picture. Now, in terms of this out Clifford algebra picture, this isn't, this does have a very beautiful structure to it. The structure of um, what's called bot periodicity, which is this notion that um, if you give me a second, it's this notion that basically there's an eightfold periodic structure to the real thing. This connects to all these different eightfold periodic 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 uh, phenomena. For example, the fundamental group of orthogonal group. Um, if you take the a large enough orthogonal group and you look at the the fundament the um homotopy groups of that, then those are going to be periodic with period eight. And yeah, there's also an eightfold classification of different symmetric spaces and a classification, in fact, of topological insulators. Um, so this uh, I heard some people in here were doing things on this, you know, read Telemon work. And that sort of ties into this Bob periodicity story, too. Um, so lots of connections to other things. But the issue is in supersymmetry, as I mentioned at the very end of last time. Supersymmetry is a low dimensional phenomenon because essentially there are too much symmetry and everything becomes trivial. Um, so all of this beautiful structure kind of boils away because we never actually get to a dimension higher than 11. Um, and we can't see the nice periodic structure. So um, here I have a little, a little drawing I made. I don't know if people can actually see that. But it's this sort of uh, exploration. Maybe I'll go and show it around. Little, 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 I kind of think about this this bot periodicity structure. There's a very, it's like a very beautiful machine. There's many, many moving parts, as you probably saw. Um, and all of these moving parts, you kind of have to understand all of them to see how they fit into all of the as other things and stuff. Um, so I think of it as like a like a Dr. Seuss sort of machine, like a factory, where all of you, where there's this underlying clock that everything's. Oh yeah. Oh, this under is clock. That's just ticking forward and forward and forward. It's clock with eight, eight directions. And I think Bob periodicity is probably my favorite theorem because it's more of a way of life. Um, all the best theorems are, but we're not going to get to enjoy much of it. We're just going to get to use the little Clifford algebras that we have and play with our little spin groups. But yeah, um, thanks for coming.